You might be making hidden mistakes in C++ that can break your code without even realizing it. Hi, I'm Ghost, and in this video, we'll be going over three C++ misconceptions that you may be unaware of. Number two is something that even experienced C++ developers get wrong, so stick around for that. But first, let's start with a simple mistake that may seem harmless, but it can make the bug in a nightmare, and that is using namespace std is always fine. Okay, so most likely you've seen this using namespace std before, and you might have been recommended to use it to access things much quicker like C out and just overall make your code much shorter. But what if I told you it could completely break your code? This is called global namespace pollution and its effects could potentially create ambiguities. Okay, so if you take a look here at this example code, I have the IO stream and I also have this CMAP library that we're including. The reason why I'm using CMAP is because I wanna access this function right here called distance. Now going along with that misconception we are including this using namespace std statement next thing we have here is a global variable called distance which is of type double and if you might have already noticed the ide is already telling us that there's an issue with this variable here and here that is because this global variable that we have here conflicts with this function up here so your code might look better because it's shorter in this case we're using c out without using std but as you see right here it says that distance is ambiguous. That is because the compiler will get confused as to which one you are referring to. If you're referring to this global variable you have here, or you're referring to the distance function of CMath. And if you look here, when we are trying to use that function from the CMath library, it is also getting confused because it doesn't understand. It is ambiguous. Now, technically you can fix this by changing the name of your variable. Let's say we call it dist now notice the errors are gone and this will work but that is just a banded solution let's take a look at another case we're going to declare a variable called max set it to 25 it does not matter what we set it to now if you look down here we have the same issue again because max is a function that belongs to the cmath library and it is ambiguous again but in this case we don't really want to rename max yes maybe you can add an underscore but this is not the recommended approach. The recommended approach is to remove this from here and to use the namespace qualifier STD and place it wherever it is required. Using the namespace qualifier instead of using this up here avoids global namespace pollution, thus avoids any ambiguities. Now that might have been an easy one, but this next one is very tricky. Even advanced C++ developers get this wrong. The number two misconception, I++ and plus plus I are the same within a loop. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, let's take a look at the code. Okay, so this may look a little bit scary, but don't worry about this class that we have up here or this variable that we have right here. I'm just using it to track how many copies that are being created, which I'll go over in a sec. So what we are going to include is our IO stream and the vector. Down here, we create a simple vector and initialize it like this. And right here, you have some bad code and then you have some good code. Now, what do I mean by I++ or plus plus I? So when you have a for loop like this, I am referring to the third argument right here when you are incrementing or simplicity when you have a loop like this where you have an integer for your index you can either write the third argument like this as a post increment or you could write it like this as a pre increment there will be no difference logically or performance wise because the compiler optimizes any primitive types like integer doubles however going back down here where you have an iterator or an object in this case that is because debug iterator is my custom class that i have up here what happens is when you post increment like this it creates a copy of that iterator or iteration so it is advised to always re-increment like this down here in the good code to avoid creating any copies of this debug iterator to prove it to you i'm going to run the code now to make things simple i created a bat file called test once you run it you will see we have our three misconceptions we already did the first one so i'm going to run the second one right here okay so for this one right here, which is our bad iterator, you see that it created five copies of this right here, the debug iterator, and you see the total size is 40 bytes. Now for the good code here, you see that zero copies were created, and of course the size is zero bytes. So just for clarity, the bad code does post incrementing, and that creates the five copies, because remember it's per iteration, and in this case we have five elements. Now for the good code, which pre-increments, as you see here, there are zero copies, meaning that the total size is zero bytes. You won't believe how many people overlook this and it slows down their program. Now, mind you, this was only five elements. What about if you have a thousand or 2000, 5000? That will grow the number of copies that get created, thus grow the total memory size of your entire program. Now, the final misconception is the biggest and will definitely crash your program and that is uninitialized pointers are always null if you're wondering what i'm talking about 
let's just look at the code. Now, if you don't know raw pointers, I'll make another video in the future to discuss what pointers are. But essentially what a pointer is, is a variable that points to some memory. Think of it like a regular street address that a postal worker have so that way they understand where they must deliver the mail to. Anyways, I'll continue with the assumption that you do understand a little bit about pointers. Now we have two pointers here. We have this pointer that is uninitialized and then we have the safe pointer which is initialized. This first one up here will cause a lot of problems later on if it is uninitialized. In short, always initialize your pointers to either this null pointer or in this case down here you can see that we will eventually point this pointer to this new memory here. So when I run this code what you're going to see at this point here is two memory addresses. One of them is going to be some random memory address, which we can call garbage address. And the other one is going to be zero. That is because no pointer essentially just means zero. Now with this line of code down here, the reason why it's commented out because it will cause our program to crash. That is because using the pointer like this with this asterisk in the beginning is our dereferencer, which will access the memory and get the value at that point. So you can think of it like this, if pointer did point towards the this memory here, which its value is number two, at this line, it would print number two. But of course, that isn't the case because at this point in the code, pointer is uninitialized. Now for extra clarity, if I was to print the safe pointer instead, we will still have an issue because even though this is initialized, it is initialized to no pointer, meaning that it is not pointing to any specific memory, which means that dereferencing will not work because we cannot dereference if the memory isn't there. Anyways, as we continue, if we do decide to give this pointer some memory, we can do it like this using a new keyword. And when we print this here, you will see that pointer will no longer be that garbage address. It will be a new address assigned by this new keyword here. And we'll see the value be the reference here, which should be two. The rest of it here goes a little bit beyond the scope, but what we're doing here is deleting the memory, or I should say freeing the memory at the address. But at this line here, when we print this pointer, which we are printing the memory address, it will still be the same as here, but the memory itself will be gone. So this pointer becomes a dangling pointer. So if we were to uncomment this out and try to dereference again, like we did up here, we will have another issue. So if you ever have to do this where you want to free the memory, you must always make sure that you set that pointer back to no pointer, which is what we do right here. So once we print again, we should get a zero instead of that memory address that we had up here. Lastly, another tip for you is that you should always be checking your pointers like so. Essentially a pointer is like a Boolean where a Boolean could either be a zero or a one. So when you set a pointer to no pointer, it is a zero and anything else is a one. So at this point here, the pointer is a zero. So this should not run this should run instead now it is important to note that this safety check here does not protect it against any dangling pointers because let's say if i did not set this pointer to null and i remove this here what's going to happen is the memory is gone so it is no longer pointing to a valid piece of memory but we didn't set the pointer to zero so when we check here, this statement will be true. Thus, it will try to run this, which in this case will try to dereference this pointer to get the value, which will then cause an error. So those are the three C++ misconceptions. Now, this isn't an exhausted list. C++ is full of surprises and there's much more to show and learn. But I just wanted to go over some beginner broad misconceptions. Now, I know this video was short, unlike my last videos, but I do plan on creating more of these in between the longer videos. So that way you can get some quick information rather than sitting there for 30 minutes to an hour of a full tutorial. Let me know in the comments if you found this video helpful and if you would like to see more of these short videos. Anyways, for your convenience, I did upload a GitHub repository for these little examples. The link is in the description below. Inside the repository, I do have a batch file as long as a shell file if you are on Mac or Linux, which will allow you to select which example that you would like to compile and run, and then it'll run it automatically for you. But of course, you're more than welcome to use your own build scripts. If you're new here and haven't watched my last video, I went over some beginner-friendly multi-threading and synchronization. I'll leave the card above so that way you can go ahead and check that out. By the way, it's also bakery themed if you're into pies or that sort of stuff. Anyways, that is it for now. I'm Ghost. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.